Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep, good. So now is for something completely different. <laughs> so I'm going to take you to outer space, right? Um, there's a lot of uh, challenges, and uh, I'll talk about the opportunities for the open source community. And my goal is to get you to contribute. So that's what I'm trying to do. I don't claim to be an expert in the space area. Okay, I'm sure there's many other people who are much better than I am at that. Uh, my daytime job is the, the company carry my name, so you can see that's where I am. And my past life, uh, I was one of the first uh, four people that uh, defined uh, the uh, first uh, PAL PC wrist microcontroller in the market, and it became very successful uh, just about everywhere in the <laughs> in. All of, the, all of the applications and things, and it found its way into the Mars uh, rover, and it went up to, to Mars. So I'm very proud of that, that accomplishment, um, among other things that I do. So the materials that I'm providing today, uh, the talk is based on things that I have been uh, doing on the work with uh, NASA. I've been the in principal investigator for a bunch of projects for them. Uh, and our company performed extensive market research uh, it, to commercialize uh, products in space applications. Okay. So why now? Why, why are you talking about space? Right? So if you look in the past, beyond the last uh, 10 years, for, for example, a lot of the things that have been launched into space uh, being launched by governments, right? You look at NASA, ESA, for example, and a few other ones. But now, um, there's a lot of commercial companies that can help you launch things into space for a very low cost, okay? Um, you look at SpaceX, they can launch multiple launches in a day now. It used to be months or years before you can launch anything, right? Um, so, the, the, the launching is rapidly moving from government to commercials. And uh, so we are sitting at a very exciting time in history. Okay, if you think back many, many years ago when people from Europe tried to discover America and then the, uh, they, they were on sailboat, by the way. Right? So they traveled very slow, many months, right? Just like in the last many years, we take many months to travel to space, right? But now people can go back and forth very easily, right? So we are at an exciting time in history. There are many applications and many uses of uh, electronics in space, okay? Um, you see them in vehicles in the middle of the slide there, right? There's all kind of rockets and things that require a lot of electronics. And if you look at uh, the right-hand side of the slide, um, there's a lot of satellites, right? Uh, you look in Starlink, they are launching like tens of, they, uh, uh, they intend to launch tens of thousands of satellites, right? And in 1999, you have uh, Cal Poly, it's a university not too far from here, and Stanford. Right, they define this thing called QSATs, okay? And that opened up a whole lot of uh, opportunity for people launching to space, small cube, at a very low cost price, right? So it opened up a whole lot of opportunities. And um, if you look on the left-hand side, um, advanced things like space telescopes, they help people explore the uh, uh, universe, right, without having to go to that galaxy or something like that, right? So the Webb uh, Space Telescope, for example, is what I'm showing there, but there are many other telescopes, space telescopes being built, right, okay? Not just from the U.S., but from other countries as well. And 
you look at things like the Mars rovers or, or rovers right? and uh, helicopters, the, I think it's called Ingenuity helicopter that's on Mars, it make records and records, break records after records, right? Okay. So it's very exciting, okay? And uh, if you look at the, the moon, okay, um, there's big programs going on for the moon. What I show there is what they call a lunar gateway, and it's composed of many different modules from different nations intended to uh, orbit around the moon, right? It serves as a gateway to the moon. So, if you look at a deployment, people are deploying from low Earth orbit to geosynchronous orbit to the moon, to Mars, and beyond. And electronics are being used for travel and explorations, but also in the future they want to establish camps and colonies and in other um, uh, planets and things. And the Artemis program, a very uh, big effort in NASA right now is to do just that, to go to de bring people back to uh, the moon, okay? Um, so you see things like satellite vehicles and space station, lunar equipment, space telescope, and yesterday I think somebody was saying that they were working on the MKIT program, which is the microwave kinetic inductance detectors, okay? I'm very happy to see that. I'm not the only one. <laughs> um, so. It requires a lot of electronics for instrumentation, for networking, for computing storage, and so on. Um, and then the, the solution that uh, apply to space, it will propagate back to Earth, okay, and for Earth uses. And you're looking at industry like the aviation, aerospace, automotive, medical, industrial, okay. There, there are a lot of uses for um, the thing that we develop in space being used here on Earth. This is a ice chart, and I don't, not meant for you to really read it, okay? What I meant to show you here is this is a uh, network in the Lunar Gateway, okay? And there are a lot of embedded nodes in the system. It's very complex, okay? It's as complex as your data center, right? <laughs> your big data center. And there are a lot of challenges, okay? So, yeah, we need electronics for communication, command control, processing, and storage, and so on. But it needs to be high reliability, okay? It needs to be fault tolerant and resilient. If there's some problems, it has to continue to work, okay? Um, or we have to be able to upgrade it, okay? Or do something with it. And it has to withstand radiations and extreme temperatures and vibrations and so on. And recently, there are problem with interference from, from man-made event, not just from natural stuff. So there's a lot of challenges in the environment itself, right? And if you look at the silicon technology, we are moving rapidly to nanoscale, right? Three nanometer and so on. Chips for space application are low volume. Yes, there's a lot, many, uses and so on, but it's still low volume compared to the commercial markets and most people don't really pay attention to it, okay, for now. Um, so space capable chips, it probably even go away at some point, okay. And when you move down to three nanometer, so expensive mega chips, it's unlikely they're going to make a chip that target for space, all right. So, the space chips also are very costly, very, very high compared to that chip that you can buy for the commercial market. So it's not affordable for most researchers. And for small companies like us, it's very hard for us to, to support them and so on. And for QSET developers or for you at the universities, it's very costly for you to buy them, right? Okay, so if you want to do more of this, we got to do something. <laughs> um, so, and the companies that sell them, they concentrate on the low Earth orbit, where the volumes and the dollars are, and the low radiation requirement associated with it because it's protected by the atmosphere, right? Okay. 
So I'm going to give you a case in point. If you look at a PGA from company names up there, <laughs> OK? Uh, in the previous generation, 65 nanometer, they designed uh, what we call radiation hardened. So this is truly radiation hardened. Okay, it can stand 1,000 k rads of total ionization, ionization dose. Okay, and 100, more than 125 um, MeV uh, of uh, uh, single event latch up. So that's truly rad hard stuff. But now you look, they move down to the geometry to 20 nanometer. They actually use the same dye that they sell for commercial as they put into what they call their space chip, okay? And it only rates at 100 K rads, so much less, right? And it only suitable for low Earth orbit, okay? So like micro semi is another one that does similar thing, okay? So you're going to see that trend, and that's going to probably continue, okay? So another thing is FPGAs. FPGAs are used extensively in space designs. And actually, many universities, they resort to use the commercial ones. Okay, Cheap, low cost, available. Yeah, it, it, it may not last very long, but <laughs> it will work sometimes. <laughs> so uh, some companies, they, what they do is they, they test these commercial chips exhaustively and uh, trying to figure out which of the product has more chance of surviving in space environment. It's very costly to do that. It's consumed times, materials, and people, and so on. And it requires sort of specialized equipment. Or uh, we can apply techniques like radiation hardened by design, or RHBD. Okay, and we'll talk about that. So RSBD, the intention is it protects vulnerabilities inside a device, right? So you look at things like flip-flops, memory, RAM, FIFO, register file, caches. But there's also things like clock and reset circuitry. God forbid if your reset got flipped, right? Not by you. <laughs> um, and and the analog modules and their IOs, that's huge problem, right? Uh, and then things that have transient error, that's like combination of logic, buses, and the connections, the metal that in them. So ASIC design, what they have done is they use uh, radiation hardened or uh, hardened libraries, OK? There are several techniques to, to de develop those. It dissipates the charges that uh, generated by the radiation, or it prevent uh, it from flipping at the transistor level. Okay, and hardened libraries are not easy to make. Few companies have them, and when you go down to nano scale, it's very rare. And people, big company that have them, they don't share because they want to bid on that big government projects, and they don't want other people to bid against them, right? So uh, they don't share, and they make it very expensive. And it's basically outreach for small companies, and you, or most of us, anyway. So if we uh, use commercial FPGA, with most of the logic issues, we can use a technique called uh, tri-modular redundancy uh, to protect the logic. Um, what TMR does is it triplicates the logic and it uses the voting logic to cross check. And when you have one bit flip, then the majority, uh, the, the, the majority voting will win. Right? Um, and for sequential logic and memory, people do like scrubbing or large memory like DRAM, they use ECC. Okay, or cache memory, you have ECC built into them. Like in the uh, Open Python uh, RISC-V, uh, <laughs> you have a ECC in the cache, okay? So that's one of the reasons why we picked that, by the way, Jonathan. <laughs> um, unfortunately, for commercial FPGAs, there are additional problems that need to be protected, okay? If you look at the configuration memories, 
there's no protection for it. Okay, you can't you, you can't go in there and do ECC on it. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, the programming circuit that is associated with it is just not protected. And the the I/O uh, that inside the FPGA, which is programmable I/O, okay, is custom designed by FPGA vendors. And uh, then you have the SERDs or the high-speed I/Os, uh, uh, HPM memory drivers, and all that stuff. None of those are protected. Okay, so the thing that I highlight here in yellow, those are the things that I think are very difficult to solve, but it's not impossible. You can do it. You can help overcome these type of problems, okay? So TMR, um, we need cores that are already uh, pre-inserted, pre-tested, so we can use it easily, okay? And or we can use an automation tools, like TMR automation tool exists. Commercial ones, like from Synopsys, they have simpli uh, simpli Simplify, and from Mentor, you have Precision. And there is an open source one from, Sp um, I think from Baylor University, it's called Sp SpiderNet uh, TMR. But the support for it is probably not there. <laughs> um, so, Automation tools uh, allow you to do fault tolerance ins uh, insertions automatically. But we, in general, we, we need IP cores that are high reliability, and that's a severely uh, lacking area. Um, we need source code available, full source code available, okay, documented, okay, and supported. So if you release cores and things, please do so. So my observations of open source is there are lots of them that are lack completeness. To me, we looking at many of them, they have missing code or they have missing document, they, they, the reliability is questionable, okay? The one that are quality one would be from university, they produce them with some kind of grant like from DAPA or something like that, right? they reliable, um, but the problem with some of those is after the people graduate and gone, you have a very hard time to get support for it, right? So there are higher quality ones for, from also from programs like DAPA, for example. Uh, they fund some open source development in the past. Um, even those, you know, they not without problems. So open source is like a sea of stuff. <laughs> it's just so vast. And um, there's definitely a need for identifying or uh, publishing a list of cores that, as you're using them, put together a list, help other people to um, see that it's usable. You know, there's just too many releases that are unusable. So I'm going to give a couple of uh, case in point. Some of the things that we released, for example, um, we released three Ethernet Mac cores through the DAPA POS program. These are uh, Ethernet, the, one of the cores is targeted for 100 gigabit per second all the way down to 10 gigabit per second. Another core target for 10 gigabit per second down to 1 gigabit per second. And the third core is the low speed. By the way, we were the first one that published these uh, these Mac core in these type of speed, and after that we see uh, some other commercial ones follow kind of our lead there, and you can you can get them from GitHub, okay. But when we re release them, we release them with complete code. We have test bench completely developed. We give out a test suite. We also give out the results that we achieve, okay. So for each of the tests that we give out, we we actually take screenshot and things show you this is what you're looking for. Uh, and we have instructions and design docs associated with them. We also do implementations. We synthesize them and we implement them FPGAs and we develop video to show demos of uh, the fact that they do work and so on. And these we use them ourselves and other people use them and we continue to update them. 
So another cause that we work with uh, Western Digital on, and they talk about that extensively uh, on Friday, so I'm not going to talk about it, but I just want to mention a few things. Um, so one of the things that I find useful for us is it can be used for uh, clusterings of servers and storage systems, uh, and it used 100 gigabit per second Ethernet core, so it can support very high speed, low latency. And so it offered the advantages of increasing performance and storage capacity, whether it's a data center or embedded network like on the Luna Gateway, okay? And it, but it offered also resiliency. So in a cluster, when something breaks or your local memory die, you can go to a guy remotely and execute off of that, okay? You don't have to worry about it not being coherent or anything like that, okay? So that I find very useful for that. And again, we released completely on to GitHub, and you can find them, I and we implemented them in VCU 118 and U50 boards. And we just uploaded a demo of the video, and you can find that at that YouTube uh, link, okay? So if you find anything there, because it's the first release of, of the video, just let us know. It's very highly integrated re release. It includes the RISC V uh, CPU from the Open Preton project and, and the NOC associated with it. And then it integrates the uh, Omni Extend Core and the 100 gigabit Mac into it. And um, that part of it is implemented in the VCU 118. And then you have the switch in the middle, and then that connected to the uh, endpoint from Western Dig Digital, which um, was implemented on the U50 board. So, I hope that you find space is an exciting area, okay? Like me, I, my interest from space was way back to the days I was in uh, undergraduate, so, <laughs> and my hair is telling you that <laughs> that's many years ago. Um, when we were designing robots that uh, cell navigating using a bit microprocessor, <laughs> so <laughs> you can you can see how far that go. Um, so I'm I'm glad to see that m several other people talk about things uh, related to space at this conference. But the thing is, most of it is digital, um, and there are many uh, RISC five CPU. I hope you move beyond that, okay, and offer. Uh, more open source core, higher quality cores. There's a severe lack of analog cores. And I think one of the problem is um, the PDK issues, right? But can you release something that before you have to apply the PDK? The PDK is really only the physical implementation that you needed it, right? So can, can you help release things before that to help other people to um, generate the actual physical layout by themselves, okay? So there's a lack of that, and there's definitely lack of a red hot peripheral cores, okay? There's severe lack of peripherals. Um, and accelerators or application-specific uh, cores, okay? And tools. Yesterday, I think someone, Alex, talked about the RDL tool. I'm glad to see that, okay? Um, we, we need more of those, okay? And we need more lists of usable, reliable cores. And maybe someday uh, down the road, we can establish an ecosystem like Latch Up here, right? For, for development for, for space open source. So open source, I believe, is very important to the space programs and space program helping to advance Mankind. So I hope you will contribute. Please, please do. Thank you. Any questions? Um, why FPGAs? What's driving the desire to use these? It seems strange that these quite vulnerable parts are attractive to space people? Is it, is it compression or flexibility? What is it that makes them yeah. appealing? 
So FPGA is very flexible. You can use for just about anything, right? And um, a lot of FPGA now, they have processor and things built into them and very low cost, right? Um, processor peripherals and then programmable FPGA built into one chip, right? It's fle flex the flexibility, I think, is the most attractive because something go wrong, you can upgrade it, change it. You know, it takes a long time to launch a thing to space. So by the time you launch, your previous code may have been outdated and you may want to put a new code. And that's, that's one of the reasons why. Um, so people doing space stuff um, actually have a lot of money. You know, rockets tend to start in the tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. How do we get that money funneled into, you know, <laughs> open source stuff, right? Like um, space is probably one area where software engineers are cheap compared to the other stuff that's going on. Uh, you, you're absolutely right. Um, so most, most of us who, who develop uh, low-cost space stuff, we hitch a ride rather than buying a rocket, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, that, that's a very good question. How do we get some of that funded back into the open source? I, I hope there's a way to do that, but I, I don't have an answer for that. Any other questions? By, by the way, so uh, some of the things NASA does, they actually, you can apply to get free flight. So there, there's a way to do that. Someone's going to space. Yeah, uh, it's called flight opportunities. And you, if you have something that you, or some, something that you really want to get launched to space, you can apply for that. I'll just add a comment that um, like SpaceX has offerings for ride shares and we're really pushing the cost, cost of that down a lot and I expect that to go down a lot more once Starship is flying. So that, that'll that like offset the cost. A lot of the like university funding ends up being towards launch. I expect once that price goes down, that money can go elsewhere. Um, so, a RAD750 chip, for example, if I buy on the market, is like 350k. For that same type of price, I can do a, you know, complete mass set plus, you know, uh, 50 wafers at, you know, on a 130 nanometer process technology. How do we, you know, take advantage of that? Any ideas? Okay, can you say the, the first part of it again? I uh, so like the Rad 750, um, you know, CPU that yeah. is the one that is used in Mars and yeah, all the things. Like if I buy a single IC of that, it's about 350k on the market. Um, like if we can make something that is half the price, it would fund you know a complete um, you know Skywater run, for example. Yeah. Um, and so you could have all this other stuff happen at the same time. Actually, I think we can, we can make Red Hot chip at a fraction of that price, even CPU. I, I believe so. Yeah, I, I know um, a, 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 board, a small board designed for space is like $100,000. <laughs> a chip designed for space, complex chip like the 750 uh, PAL PC chip is run for a few hundred thousand dollars, like he said. Um, but with these tools available from you, from Open Road, for example, or Skywater process and, and things like that, we definitely can make things a lot cheaper and red hot. So if there's no further questions, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>